good afternoon. Uh, first of all, microphone? microphone, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Kim and uh, Professor OK to invite me. Um, I really enjoy the, um, the visit to Korea every time, and uh, certainly more of the friendship we have over the years uh, developed. And uh, the friendship actually helps uh, the science collaboration. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, uh, a little bit focus on the cities, urbanization. Professor Wang already uh, uh, touched upon this topic, uh, as we are becoming more urbanized. Um, and my background is biogeochemistry, so I try to apply what we are doing uh, to develop sustainable cities. Um, just a quick um, uh, overview. Uh, probably you are all very aware of, um, by the end of the year 2007, globally, we are becoming urbanized. So over 50 of the world population uh, live in the cities uh, by that time. Um, and also uh, in China, traditionally as a largest agricultural society, uh, by the end of year 2011, we also have over 50% uh, of the population now live in the city. So that is really a dramatic uh, demographical change, but more importantly, is a societal, economic, and environmental change um, uh, in, the, in, 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 in the history. Um, we, the urban ecosystem is so different from the natural ecosystem and the agriculture ecosystem. In the urban ecosystem, we are the dominant species. We, as us uh, here, is a dominant species. So the ecosystem is also highly engineered. We have uh, wastewater treatment plant. We have drainage system. They are equivalent to the, when the earthworm move around in the, in the soil, like we are moving around in the urban ecosystem. So we are equal, or not equal, but the, we are equivalent to species like earthworm changing the ecosystem, perturb the ecosystem. So that's why re resilience, the term resilience comes in. When we perturb the ecosystem, how the ecosystem respond, how the ecosystem can recover um, to the, uh, to the uh, initial state. So this I borrowed a, 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 a slide from uh, Resilient Cities. This is an organization, uh, international organization about resilient cities. So when we talk about resilient cities, it's transferring some of the theoretical framework of resilient science to practice the sustainability of urban system. And this urban system is dominated by humans. And are facing, we are facing environmental, social, and economic challenges. So I think one of the characteristics of urban ecosystem or urban resilience it's actually the coupling of environmental, social, and economic systems. So I think probably you are all aware of this uh, resilience uh, framework. I'm not going to go details, uh, just to, to show you that um, how a system can respond to perturbance uh, from external forces. Um, just to, to illustrate this uh, issue a bit more, here I want to show you that um, uh, the general impacts of urbanization. So we, we see lots of benefits of uh, being urbanized or being in the cities. We enjoy centralized uh, facilities, uh, health care, sanitation. These are all positive. However, on the, on, on, in the same time, we have some disadvantages because within the urban system, uh, uh, the energy and material consumption per unit land increases dramatically. So that also comes with the uh, 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 biogeochemical processes. So in a resilient ecosystem, the material cycling is more or less balanced, let's say, in the natural environment. Uh, the earthworms are working for us, 
the microbes are working for us. So they, 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 it's balanced. But in the urban ecosystem, we are accumulating food and the people. And in the end, the nutrients, the nutrients are also being urbanized. We have accumulation of phosphorus and the nitrogen in the urban environment and in the peri-urban environment. They are causing problems like uh, the deterioration of um, uh, some of the ecosystem functions. So here I also mentioned that uh, the impervious surface, you know, we have pavement, so the, the natural soil ac actually can, can filter the water. They can attenuate the contaminants, the nutrients. However, when we urbanize, there's a, a lot of Im impervious surface, and as they create the problem of the hydrological cycling, flooding, and the contamination, of course. So this also uh, impacted the uh, aquatic environment, and also like urban transport and the fossil fuel burning, they are all they can all release contaminants. Uh, in, addi in addition to this carbon dioxide as a as a global warming uh, driving force, there are many other contaminants, and many of them are micro pollutants uh, that Professor Wang has already talked about. I want to illustrate the issue a bit further using phosphorus, because phosphorus is critical. In my opinion, phosphorus is even more important than energy. We have the sun. We can always get energy from the sun. And we can always get some nu nuclides that we can produce energy from nuclear uh, reactions. But the phosphorus is really uh, non-renewable resources. When we explore the phosphorus deposit, we make fertilizers. We consume the food, we treat the wastewater, and the phosphorus is eventually discharged into the river, into the soil, into the ocean, or ended up in the landfill. So they are not being brought back into the food pro production system. So that caused the problem of non resilient, non resilient biogeochemical cycling. So this is uh, an, an article in nature a few years ago, so it's the disappearing nutrient, disappearing nutrient. So, um, and I, with my colleague, we did some analysis. So this diagram actually visualized the problem. So our 50% population live in less than 1% of the land surface. So occupy a small area, the cities, small area. But we consume over 60% of the food, the national food. The food is there from the countryside, from far away. But we are concentrating this in this narrow, tiny place. So you can see how we are accumulating the nutrients in the urban environment. And that causes some of the problems, the non-resilient problems. Here just some pictures. Uh, if you travel in China, you often see many lakes are being eutrophicated. So agar blooming, toxic agar blooming causing the death of fish, uh, the invasive species, aquatic plants. So this is really, I consider it as a, a vicious cycle of this broken, uh, due to the broken biogeochemical cycling. So in the old traditional agriculture society, we recycle pretty much everything back to the agriculture field. However, with this modernization, urbanization, we are blocking, we are breaking this cycling and end up with the accumulation of nutrients in the urban and the peri-urban environment. So this is again another uh, picture, uh, two pictures show you the landscape after big rain. You can see here is a flooding and this discharge of contaminants and water, waste water from the urban environment during these events. So in China now we are promoting the idea of a, a, a spongy city. So how can we develop a city more resilient to the environmental condition? If the city can absorb the rainwater, 
and it discharges them in a more natural way, we can mitigate the environmental problems. So this is so-called as green infrastructure or nature-based infrastructure for these environmental problems. Um, so I just want to summarize what I have uh, just mentioned. How can we manage this biogeochemical cycling for resilient cities? First of all, we should try to understand the stock and the flues of these materials uh, in urban and peri-urban environment so that we can reveal the source and the fate of the contaminants and nutrients. Where are, they, where are they from? Where are they going? So we have to know that. And we also have to understand the processes of the material flows, the processes, and the fluxes indeed. Uh, so this is the, the core issue of urban biogeochemistry. And we should also look at the landscape and ecosystem services. For example, the water quality, carbon stocks. Uh, Professor Bolan will talk about the carbon sequestration in the ecosystem. And I think in this urban, peri-urban environment, those issues are also embedded, embedded in this resilient science. And of course, for urban ecosystem, food security is among the top. And here, I mean food security in, in terms of both quantity and quality. So food security also included issues that Professor Wang has already illustrated about the contaminants, mercury, arsenic, or other PTS in the food. And many other issues, uh, probably some other speakers will touch upon that, but I, for the sake of time, I just uh, illustrate these issues for consideration. And how can we increase the resilience of the urban ecosystem? We know the urban ecosystem is highly perturbated and is highly um, uh, engineered. How can we make it more resilient? So we, we propose the idea together with uh, uh, Dr. Brian Reed from UEA, England. We propose the idea of um, this um, peri-urban ecosystem. We call it a pure, because essentially it can purify many of these contaminants in the in the in the peri-urban ecosystem. So this just a diagram to show you um, this uh, this uh, structure of the ecosystem from the atmosphere atmosphere to the to the vegetation, soil, groundwater, bedrock, and also to the surface water, surface runoff, etc. So we have three, um, main, roughly we have three different ecosystems. This urban ecosystem, this is a rural urban transition zone. So that is the one we are talking about, the pure peri-urban ecosystem. They sit at the interface between the rural natural ecosystem and the urban ecosystem. So this, this pure is very important because they can um, act as a filter, as a filter. So you can see that the urban ecosystem, we are talking about the eco-infrastructure, the nature-based solution, and uh, the cultural health, biodiversity. And this are we all probably aware. In the urban environment, we need the parkland. We need uh, um, beautiful lakes because they provide the amenity and they provide the place that we can relax uh, this, is, this is becoming the ecosystem services of all this will uh, be beneficial to urban health and well being. However, in the pure, this peri urban ecosystem, there can be um, a place for waste assimilation. I will provide some examples food production, water supply, and of course, culture, biodiversity. You know, in the peri urban environment, often you can set up uh, leisure, ecological parks, and um, people can go there, pick up uh, fruits, uh, make picnic, you know, this all will benefit our health and well-being. Uh, this is the rural ecosystem, it's mainly for food production, water supply, biodiversity, and also natural reserves. So this is uh, uh, the concept of PURE, and uh, to summarize the uh, ecosystem services provided the PURE, I can summarize here. So first of all, as I said, it can be 
the repository of contaminants and also nutrients for cities, probably uh, mainly from water, air, and also waste discharge. Waste discharge. And they are the major food source for urban populations. So, you know, if, if we want to have an efficient food system, you don't want to, your food to be transported from New Zealand or from the United States. We hope we should try to produce the food locally so the, the carbon footprint of the food is minimal or it is minimized. And I think it is all also the best showcase to balance different ecosystem services. We, we know that the ecosystem has multifunctionalities. And some, sometimes the multifunctionalities, they are, always, they are not always in harmony. Sometimes they are in conflict. And we have to balance that. So this is called a trade-off of ecosystem services. And this peri-urban environment or ecosystem is really a place that we have to balance this, whether it is for food, whether it is for water quality, or it is for culture, leisure, health, you know. So we, we need to balance these ecosystem services. And in the past, I would like to say, this peri-urban ecosystem is largely overlooked. And in China, it's particularly important. We are currently, the, the, the current government is uh, very keen on this people-oriented urbanization. Because in the, in the past, we perceive city as a place for business, for making money, for generating GDP. But in fact, we are going to the cities for better life. Better cities for better life. So urban health and well-being is a holistic view of urbanization. It's not just about money, it's about overall health and well-being. So, so I think this is uh, something I want to just quickly summarize. Um, one area is related to this resilient city is the waste uh, reutilization and disposal and a safe use. So it's a valorization of urban waste, which I think is a key to sustainable and resilient cities. However, we have lots of micro pollutants in the waste stream because we are using shampoo, we are using soap every day, and we sometimes take in drugs. And these drugs and these components, these chemicals, they are discharging with the waste stream into the water, into the soil. So this has to be um, considered. So one of the examples we have been doing in China is looking at the microbes. So you, you talk about uh, other pollutants, chemical pollutants, but the microbes, they are unique. If they are act acting as a pollutants, they can be amplified because they are lives. When they arrive in a new destination, they can proliferate. And they, just as a pollutants, as a pathogen, or as a virus, you know, they can be... So here I want to use um, the use of sewage sludge and the discharge of antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance. We are all very aware this antimicrobial resistance is a global, uh, is a global uh, public health threat, threat because we are using antibiotics too much in our humans and our animals and they are exert as they are exerting as a as a selection pressure for the microbe so the microbes develop resistance and if the pathogens acquire this resistance determinants they become superbugs that means if there are superbugs there's a maybe little hope for treating uh, patients so we use this long-term experimental site to look at uh, uh, the accumulation of uh, resistant genes so these genes are actually pollutants. You can see the concentrations. With the application of sewage sludge, there is increase of uh, uh, these pollutants. Clearly, you can see that. However, we can also turn sewage sludge into baocha. Into baocha, we, uh, uh, we can kill. We can kill the microbes. And we can um, uh, destroy this uh, antibiotic compound. So, we think that uh, turning sewage sludge into 
bao cha is a very good way of assimilating urban waste in peri-urban ecosystem for food production. So here, this is an article we published uh, a few years ago. Uh, you can see that uh, this huge sludge de derived biochar uh, can be used and uh, to promote the growth of rice, the yield, and uh, we, we, we still get the relatively reasonably safe food because the biochar can sequestrate the metals and reduce the, um, destroy the organic compound. And in this, you know, we are collaborating with Professor uh, Oak in, in, in this Korean Baocha Center. And this waste management, I, I think, it can be integrated into green infrastructure because this Baocha you can use to improve the soil, soil conditions. You know, you mix the Baocha with the soil, you increase the filtration. So the water can move quickly into the soil without causing flooding. And the biochar itself can retain the microbes and the nutrients, so it can uh, act as a buffer zone for protecting the aquatic ecosystem. So this is just an example we have done in China, in Wuhan, central China. This is a city with more than 1,000 lakes. So this uh, aquatic ecosystem is very important. So we developed some uh, uh, demonstration areas, improved the soil, soil quality by improving the infiltration and the vegetation, you increase the resilience of the city. So I think there are many benefits of, uh, or cool benefits of uh, waste-derived biochar. Nutrient recovery, I, I talked about phosphorus as a crisis, but with biochar we can recover phosphorus and also other micronutrients, silicon also. Silicon is important for rice growth. Um, and improve soil structure. I uh, already used this, some examples. If eco infrastructure and a buffer zone contaminant attenuation. And they can also be used as novel materials. Uh, other no normal, novel what materials I think we can derive. And to eliminate pathogens, antibiotic resistant genes in organic waste. So these are the benefits or could benefits of uh, valorization of urban waste. And also, uh, probably you see that uh, my paper uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I published in, in Science. I talked about uh, the microbial mass movement. So when we talk about uh, uh, ecosystem resilience, we often see what we can, uh, uh, we often talk about the system we can see with our naked eyes. However, behind this, what we see, there is a microbial world. It's, it's invisible, but they are changing all the time. And the microbes, they travel with no boundary. So for example, when we are arriving in Seoul, we go through the custom. But the microbes, there's no custom for the microbes. They can be traveling freely around the globe. Come with the food, with the water, with our human body. We carry more cells than ourselves. When we arrive in Seoul Airport, we carry more cells, more bacteria cells than our uh, mammalian cells in our body. So the microbial world is certainly is an area for uh, investigation. So I just want to uh, quickly go through this, uh, just the example of uh, the genes we are talking about. This is a gene cassette that recruit new genes and uh, the horizontal gene transfer. And um, um, I don't want to go into details, but I welcome questions or even collaborations in the future. And how can we improve the urban ecosystem resilience? We propose that uh, this critical zone science can actually improve the urban resilience. Because this critical zone science, we consider uh, the coupling and the relevant and the co comprehensive understanding of the whole ecosystem. So we try to put the bits of the system together, use a holistic approach. When we talk about the soil, we also should talk about the groundwater, also talk about the food, the food. When we talk about the air pollution, also soil and water. So as a system, so systems approach is important for urban resilience. And I think critical zone science can offer 
some uh, some benefits or advantages. So some challenges we are facing. So how how can we characterize the urbanizing critical zone? So critical zone taking this uh, vegetation, soil, groundwater as a system, as a together. So this is essentially the life supporting system of our planet. We talked about the planetary uh, boundary, and this is the important boundary of the Earth system, the critical zone. And the impact of, uh, for example, organic amendments, this carbon quality quantity from cities and soil functions, and urban pollutants or ecosystem, human health, integrating with urban green infrastructure, and also mitigating, uh, we should develop mitigation uh, approaches and also modeling to predict the future, the future changes of the ecosystem, urban ecosystem. So with that, I would like to conclude uh, my talk. I hope that uh, um, the concept of resilient city, I have uh, emphasized that uh, the integration and the interactions within the Earth's surface system is important as a, as a whole rather than in pieces. At the urban rural interface, that is a pure uh, biogeochemistry is critical in maximize urban ecosystem services for resilient cities. And the resource, of course, it's uh, carried by materia, recycling and recovery, it's not only an in engineering challenge, but also a challenge for environmental sustainability. And I think that antimicrobial resistance can be used as an example to test our hypothesis and to also develop novel solutions. If we can solve the problem of this invisible world, probably it's easier to solve some of the problem we can see by naked eyes. And uh, with that, I also want to thank uh, the Natural Science Foundation of China, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and also UK, the Newton Fund, NERC, for uh, continuous support towards my research and also my students and colleagues uh, in many places and uh, international collaborators uh, for this uh, 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 area of research in, over the years. Um, and this is my institute, Institute of Urban Environment. And I, I, I welcome you all to my institute and we develop joint projects. And I also want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>